temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Sing that again. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God. Listen, y'all can go ahead and have a seat for just a minute. I I want you to finish this scripture with me. Who the Son has set free is free indeed. Do y'all believe that? Who the Son has set free is free indeed. We have been singing songs about our freedom in Christ. And we're not talking about patriotic freedom, though we are thankful that God blesses us in a country to certainly be able to have the freedom to worship. But we're talking about being free from the punishment of sin. We're talking about being free from the consequences of sin. We're talking about being free from eternity separated from God. And we're talking about being free, being able to serve God. Listen, if you're a guest with us today, we want you to know that we are so thankful that you are here. If you'll take just a moment and fill out that welcome home card that's in the pew back in front of you, we'd love to, uh, you to hand that to us after service. You can drop it in the offering plate if you'd like. And we just want to say welcome uh, join, for joining us here at Clough, but to the rest of us, on your way in, you got something special this morning. You got a little bookmark that looks like this, and we're going to do something with that bookmark here in this prayer time. See, we have been walking through a study called Who's Your One? As a matter of fact, as I sat with our deacons this morning, we each went around the table and shared our one with each other. Because we believe that this is a call for every single person, every single believer to have one person that they are praying for, one person that they are inviting to worship, one person that they are sharing the gospel with. And here's what we want you to do very specifically during your prayer time this morning. We want you to take this and on the back side of it, you're going to write that one person's name in. We hope everybody has one. We've been going at this a couple weeks. If you have one person that you're praying for, that you're intentionally inviting to church, and if God gives you the opportunity you will share your faith with, we want you to write that person's name in the back side of this card. And then I want you to do something else for me. I want you to look at that perforated line, and I want you to tear it off. Will you take a minute and do that? Because there's going to be a second step. On the back side of this, you'll fill out that person's name and then tear it along the perforated edge and you will hold that up just like this this morning. Go ahead. You got a minute. No worries. We're not rushing you. If you don't have a person, that's okay. We want you to be thinking about that person that you are going to be praying for and inviting and sharing the gospel with. But for those of us who have been here the past few weeks, we certainly hope that you have that person. Now, after you have written the name of your one on the back of this card, and after you have torn it along that perforated edge, I want you to do something for me. We don't want you to just be praying for this person alone. Our staff wants to pray with you. I'm so grateful that we have a staff that loves to pray. We love to lift our church body up in prayer. And so this morning, we want you to join with us in prayer. You're going to take this card. You're going to bring it up here. You can lay it right here on one of the steps. or You can leave it in the pews and stay up here with me this morning. Join me this morning. We're going to cry out to God on behalf of our ones, wherever they are that they might see Jesus in us, that they might experience his presence, his richness, his goodness, that they might join us for worship, that they might hear the good news, 
and they might come to know Jesus as we do. If you'd like to bring your one up this morning, we're going to give you plenty of time. You can leave the card on the altar or leave it on the pews, on this front pew. And our staff is going to take each one of these, and we're going to pray over these this week. And we encourage you to come and join us at the altar to pray for your one. If you don't have a card for any reason, you can grab one at the back. Hey, just come on forward right now, but you can grab one at the back after service and make sure you leave that before you, you uh, leave here th today. But we want to encourage you to come this morning as we pray for our ones together. This is your time. Bring your one to the altar this morning. This is your time to move. This is our time to pray. This is our time to cry out to God. There's no reason for any of us to not to stay in our seats when God has called us to a task like this. Join us in prayer this morning. God, I know for me, sometimes it takes me just a little while to get the point. God, be it hesitancy or unassuredness, timidity, however we want to phrase it. God, I think of a million excuses not to be about the mission that you have instructed us as believers and us as the church to be about. I think of a million excuses and a million reasons and a million thoughts that often come before your great commission to go to make disciples, to baptize, to teach, God, to obey your commission and to trust your promise that you are with us always. And the moments of doubt and the moments of fear and the moments of hesitancy, God, that you're with us. Whether we have a plan or don't have words at all, you are with us. God, we can trust you with this. This morning, Lord, we lift up our ones to you. Some of us have been burdened for them for years and decades. People who we long to see know the sweetness of your grace. For others, you've recently put one person on our hearts. One person to pray for, one person to invite to worship, one person to share with. God, regardless of how long they've been on our hearts, we know that the burden that we have is nothing compared to the burden that you have. Your word assures us that you wish none would perish, but that all might come to knowledge and to faith in Jesus Christ. So God, we are praying in accordance to your word. We know because we're praying for the lost, we're praying in accordance to your will. God, help us believe this morning. Help us to trust this morning. Help us to be willing to obey your teaching this morning. Because God, you care for each one of these ones. And God, you desire to use each one of us to bring these ones to saving knowledge of Jesus. God, we lay them not just on steps and on pews, but we lay them at the altar of your feet. God, we lay them before the throne of grace. And God, we say, move in power. 
we trust you to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for praying with me this morning, church. We'd love for you to continue to stand and worship our Savior this morning.
I gain? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. His wounds have paid my ransom. prayer today that we surrender all to you. And as we move into this time of worship through the word, I pray that you would change hearts and lives today, that we would put aside distractions and focus on what you are saying 
in this place. God, I pray for Josh as he brings the message. You would use him to speak your truth into our lives. God, I pray for life change in this place today. We love you and we thank you. It is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, some of you guys, you hear the uh, lyrics, I surrender all, and you know it's immediately time for an invitation. Now, here's the good news. I assure you, we're going to have one today, right? But you can actually make this decision up front. See, as the people of God, we're going, we know that uh, in church, we're going to get into the Word of God, especially in this church. We, we know as the people of God, we're going to get into the Word of God. And here's what we know. We know that because we are in God's Word, that God is going to speak to us through his spirit, through his word, not through just the person on the platform, but through his spirit, through his word, he's going to speak to us. And his word is going to challenge us to do something. His word is going to call us to action. It's not just because of the series that we're in. It's every time we approach the word of God, we can trust that God's voice is going to come through and his word is going to call us to action. So we don't even have to wait till the end of the service to respond to the invitation. You can respond right now and here's how you do it. You just say, God, whatever your word says, that's what I'm gonna do. God, whatever your word says, that's what I'm gonna do. That's a really good way to respond to God's word every time we go to it, whether we're in worship together or whether we're reading the Bible by ourselves. God, we're going to open up your word. Your word is truth. Whatever your word says, that is what I am going to do. You know, I was thinking about the series that we're in. We're in this Who's Your One series, and we're in a series that is challenging us in immense ways to be about the work that Christ has called us to do, namely to get the gospel out, to get the gospel out of these walls, to get the gospel out of just these, this word right here, these Bibles, to get the gospel out of just our brains and to start sharing the gospel with everybody that we come in contact with, specifically our one. That's that one person that we're talking about, not three different people, that one person that we're praying for, that one person that we desire to be inviting to worship uh, this year, that one person that if given the opportunity, each of us will take the opportunity to share the gospel with. That's the good news. That's what leads to salvation. It's the gospel message. Here's what I want you to hear this morning. I believe, I believe that this sermon series, I believe that this challenge, who's your one, can truly change the trajectory in the life of every single one of us who are here, every single one of us who are here for any part of this sermon series. This Who's Your One series can truly change the trajectory of your life, as well as radically change our church and our community. Now listen, that's a big statement, and I don't want you to think that I am taking that statement lightly. I am truly serious. I believe that this Who's Your One series, this radical message, this call to radical obedience and sharing our faith can change the trajectory of our lives, can change the trajectory of our church and our community. Listen, I believe that the church is supposed to be a rescue mission and that each Christian is supposed to be a missionary. I love what Charles Spurgeon, the famous Baptist preacher said. He says, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. You got A or B, which one are you? It's that simple. But here's the problem. In any church, including ours, that we are filled with Christians, period. I just want you to hang on to that for a second. The problem with any church, including ours, is quite simply that we are filled with Christians, period. That's it. You say, Josh, you say that like it's a bad thing. And I want you to hear me clearly when I say that that indeed is a bad thing. And what's worse is that oftentimes for most Christians, the longer we are in church, the less and less we care about those who are not. Did you hear that? For most Christians, the longer we are in church, the less and less we care about about those who are not. Let me ask you, does that even make sense to you this morning? I think the exact opposite should be true, amen? The longer we follow Christ, the more desperate we should be that others would as well. The longer we follow Christ, 
The closer and more quickly we see eternity approaching, the more eager we ought to be as believers to see others approach eternity with us. I've seen this uh, quote on social media. It's probably one that some of you retweeted. If you retweeted it, I'm not calling you out. Or if you posted it, I'm not calling you out. I just think it's interesting. It's a quote by A.W. Tozer. I've seen it plenty of times in recent years. And I absolutely love A.W. A. Tozer, by the way. One of my uh, favorite books that, uh, that he writes calls us to a deeper relationship with God. But here's what he says in this quote. And I just, it just struck me as I was preparing for the sermon this week. It says this, we need preachers who preach that hell's still hot, heaven's still real, sin's still wrong, and God's word is still God's word. Amen. That's awesome, right? I knew that that was going to prompt that reaction. Then here's why. Because every single time I see this, this quote or this picture posted on social media, it is very quickly liked by friends and amens follow like libations in a country song. Here's the thing. You know what's really awful? What's really awful is this, that the commentator on social media and everyone who liked an amen on social media somehow thinks that they've done their jobs and somehow promoted the kingdom just because they clicked a few keys on their keyboards. Let me let you know something this morning. Sharing cute Christian memes is not gonna get you jewels in your crown when it comes time for eternity and glory. That's not going to do it. I don't think that's what God had in mind when he talked about jewels and the crowns of the believers and the saints who followed him. So I think that's a pretty big wrong thing. Not that the statement's wrong, but rather our attitude that if we amen and we like such a statement that we've done our job. Number two, there are some, maybe in this room this morning, who are more upset that I use the word libations in a sermon than the fact that their loved ones are lost and will spend eternity in a hot hell in a Christless eternity, and they haven't done anything about it. That's a pretty serious problem, church family. So here's the question I want to ask you this morning. Will someone, will anyone spend eternity in heaven because of your faithfulness to share the gospel with them? That's the challenge. Will someone, will anyone spend eternity in heaven because of your faithfulness to share the gospel with them? Listen, I'm not trying to get overly theological. What God's word tells us is that it's God's job to do the saving, but, and there's a huge but in this, but he calls us to partner with him in sharing the message of salvation, which is the gospel. The gospel makes all of this possible. The Bible says in Romans chapter one, verse 16, that it is the gospel that is the power of God for salvation. And in this very same passage, Paul writes and he says, but I am not ashamed to the gospel. I'm the one that's going to do something about it. A little bit later in this wonderful theological expose that Paul writes to the church in Rome, he says this in Romans chapter 10, he, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That everyone should include your one. It should include my one. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he goes on to say this, but how will they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him and whom they have never heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And by the way, you can mark it in your Bible if you like, that preacher that's referencing is not the person on stage, it's the person in the pew. In other words, we're all responsible to share the message. That word preacher that it's using there has no, it, listen, Paul's not writing about the pastor of the church. He's writing about the proclaimer of the message. That's not up here. That is out there. I want to make that so incredibly clear. He goes on, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? Are you sent, church? Are you sent with the gospel? Do you understand the implications of the Great Commission that, that Jesus' last words to his disciples were to go and make more disciples? And that wasn't for just those disciples, but that was through every disciple throughout all the generations. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach them, and repeat, right? It's kind of like washing your hair, wash, rinse, repeat. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach them, and repeat. That is the call of the church. It's the mission of the church. We don't need to make any bones about it. 
And then he says, as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Listen, church, I want you to hear through this message this morning. I want you to hear the weight of the message. I want you to hear the invitation of the message. I hope you've already responded. I surrender all. Jesus, this is your word. Whatever it says, that's what I'm going to do. I want you to be thinking about your one. And you might be thinking this morning, well, that's just one person. You're talking about a great big lost world. That's just one person. The truth is we're prone to think of one as small and insignificant. After all, who wants just one cookie or one dollar bill, right? But the Bible constantly speaks of one. The Bible constantly speaks of the one pearl of great price. The Bible constantly speaks of the one lost sheep. The Bible constantly speaks of the one wayward son. And the Bible reassures us that your one matters to our one God, the one true God. And we are called to one mission, and that mission is to share this one gospel message with everyone that we come in contact with, including your one. I want you to hear this. You might be thinking one doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter if I share the gospel with my one. As a matter of fact, I'm just one person. It doesn't really matter if I am one that shares. The the disciples often overlook the value of one. One invitation to church. One message of hope. One neighbor, one coworker, one friend. Again, we go back to the point. And we're going to see it so clearly in our text this morning. Can you name any one person? who has come to Christ through your invitation or witness. Here's the sad reality that most church members cannot. Most people who say they are followers in Christ cannot name one person who has come to Christ because of their invitation or their witness. Listen, this is not a guilt trip message. This is a let's change that message. Do you understand what we're saying? This is not to make you feel bad if you're going, I don't have one person that I can name that's going to enter eternity in heaven because of my invitation and witness. My goal today is not to make you feel bad. My goal today is to say, let's change that. Let's do something about that. Let's get this right, church family. This matters way, way too much. You know, I was thinking about some of the people that I've led to Christ over the years of my life. One of my absolute favorite stories is when I was back in high school, one of the first people that I had the privilege of leading to Christ. I was actually in choir at the time. I was in choir. You, you might not believe it now, but I, I used to sing. Give me a minute. I, I might sing again, uh, just like I used to play drums. And, you know, when Steve and Sean are both out, they let me beat on the drums from time to time. Here's the thing. So I was in choir back in the day. And I, I remember one of uh, my friends, he was actually the pastor's kid at the time. He comes up to me and he says, listen, Josh, I, I have this friend of mine and he's actually a pastor's kid at another church, by the way. And, and I'm talking to him about this faith that we have in Jesus and how we have this hope. And, and he told me that he doesn't know if he has really accepted Jesus as a savior. He does not know if he's really saved. And he goes, so I, I'm having this conversation with him, but I don't know what to do. I said, you know what? I, I know what to do. I, we've been training for this. We've been talking about this and, and youth group and things like that. I know what to do. So we went and uh, over lunch, I began to share the gospel with this young man in the library. And as a matter of fact, uh, it got so late in the afternoon that the bell had rung and it was time to go back to class. But the, the objective of sharing the gospel that this young man might receive Christ had not ended. I said, you got to hold on one second. The class was really close by. And I ran back and I talked to my teacher who happened to be a Christian at the time. I said, listen, I know your class is important, but this is more important. And she said, yes, absolutely. It is just get back to class as fast as you can. I went back to the library after that. And we began to talk more and more about what it meant to put his faith and his hope in Christ. Listen, he walked into the building that day, not knowing if he had a relationship with Jesus. He walked into the building that day, just thinking he was going to school. 
He walked into the building that day, not knowing where he was going to spend eternity, whether it was going to be in a hot hell or in the glory of heaven in the presence of Christ. He walked into that building, not knowing a lot of things, but I want you to understand that that young man on that one day, without knowing what that day was going to hold, walked out of the building knowing he had trusted Jesus. That is the power of one conversation. That's the power of being intentional about our witness. That's the power of these types of things. Listen, we're gonna read in in, um, I'm sorry, we are going to read in 1 John. We'll read in Matthew a little bit later. But we're going to read in John chapter 1, not 1 John, John chapter 1, beginning in verse uh, 43 is where we are going to pick up. It's the power of one. It's the story of when Jesus calls a young na- man named Philip, and Philip takes that message, takes that invitation, and goes and calls one of his friends. Here's what it says, beginning in verse 43, John chapter 1. It says, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. Philip wasn't looking for Jesus, but Jesus was looking for him. And Jesus says to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. We find there was a story about Andrew and Peter. Peter gets introduced to Jesus, and then Peter calls Andrew along. And so Philip had already seen the call and response work in Peter and Andrew's life. It says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote about. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael responds and says to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip simply says, why don't you come and check it out? You know, we were talking in deacons meeting this morning and uh, we have a good time in there. We have some amazing leaders in there. I'm so grateful for each and every one of them. And I don't remember who it was, but we are talking about our ones going around the table and sharing. And uh, one of them says, you know, I- I'm inviting, I'm pulling on this one person that God has placed on my heart. And, and one of the hangups is that word Baptist. And you can kind of hear it in Nathaniel's response. Can anything good come out of a Baptist church? You mean those people over there? I just like, come on and see, right? Come and see what Jesus is doing in this place. Listen, I don't know what the hiccup is with your one, but our response can absolutely be come and see. I want to give you a couple of points this morning. I believe that this passage shows us a couple of great truths that we need to be living out in our life every day. And here's the first truth that we need to be living out our life every day. If you are going to be a witness, it is going to take great intentionality on your part. You understand what I'm saying? If you are going to be a witness, you need to commit right now to being an intentional witness. I want you to hear me very clearly. There's no such thing as an unintentional witness. Have you, maybe you're like me. You see the dishes in the sink and you think to yourself, I'm going to wash those later. But the truth of the matter is, is that the next day comes and the dishes continue to pile up. And at least when I was in college and didn't have a wife that told me, now's the time to wash the dishes, Josh. Listen, the dishes went undone. Maybe you're like me and you have the laundry pile on the floor and you think I'm going to wash those later, but later doesn't come. Or maybe you're like me when it came to writing papers in college and I was the great procrastinator. I would say, I'm going to do that later, but later required me begging for an extension from my professor. Listen to what I'm saying, is if you are not intentional in this, if you're not intentional in this one thing, this one thing will simply never happen. That's a truth that we need to live with this morning. If we are going to be witnesses, it's going to require great intentionality on our part. It does not just happen. It's going to require us to hold ourselves accountable, just like it's going to require Mandy to hold me accountable to do the dishes. By the way, I, I don't mind doing the dishes. I've learned to like it over time. But it's going to require maybe you saying, hold me accountable. You know, help me to make sure that I'm praying for my one. Hold me accountable to inviting my one. Hold me accountable to sharing with my one. It's going to require a great stick to It's going to require a great commitment. It's going to require a little bit of accountability. And it's going to require a lot of 
intentionality on your part if we are going to be people who are going to share Jesus with other people, if we're going to be people who are going to reach our one, if we're going to be a church that impacts our community, it will require intentionality. Now, a lot of you know that uh, I spent this past week in New Orleans. It's one of my favorite cities. It's where I did um, my graduate work for seminary. And somebody messed up and made me a trustee at my seminary, which means that I get to go back and drink a lot of coffee and eat beignets and have a lot of fun with professors and friends that I've built relationships with throughout the years. And I really enjoy my time down in New Orleans. But here's the thing that sticks out about my seminary. Somebody commented this past week on one of the posts, well, What about this seminary and what about that seminary? I'm not saying there's bad seminaries out there, but this is what I know about my seminary. My seminary is about the mission. My seminary is about getting the gospel to the city. As a matter of fact, here's the cool little fact of Baptist history, a cool little tidbit of Baptist history that you can learn today. See, there are six Southern Baptist seminaries and only one was planted to reach the city and the community for the Lord Jesus Christ. There are six seminaries that are dedicated to training up pastors and missionaries to go out with the gospel message, but only one was planted intentionally to reach the community for Jesus. Here's how the story goes down. See, a bunch of Baptists had gathered together, and any time Baptists gather together, we like to drink coffee, we like to eat, and we like to talk about what we're going to do for the kingdom. Those are good things, right? But they were gathered together, and they thought to themselves, where is one place that, where is the darkest place in our country that we need to impact for Jesus Christ? At the time, the city of New Orleans had only one evangelical church in the entire city. It's a very Catholic city, much like the city of Cincinnati. It only had one, one gospel-believing evangelical church in the entire city. They said, there, that's the darkest place. That's the place that we need to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they planted that seminary. Here's the cool thing. They have not lost this mission. They have not lost this mission. As a matter of fact, uh, we had uh, our time of inauguration over our ninth president this past week. It's a pretty cool thing. It was a special thing to be a part of Dr. Jamie Dew, and he is well qualified. He's way smarter than I could ever hope to be. He has two PhDs, uh, one from over here at Southeastern and another one from over in England. They're PhDs in philosophy. He knows words I cannot say, right? And not because they're bad words. I just can't pronounce them. All right. Here's the thing. I want you to hear, with all the pomp and circumstance that comes with the inauguration of a president of an institution, the day before, this is what they did. They went out and served the city. The day before, all the pomp and circumstance, all the accolades, the day before, he goes up in his, you know, regalia and has the medal of the president hung around his neck. He goes out with the students and he serves the city. They go out with the students and they prayed for the city. They go out with the students and they shared the gospel with the city. And it was not lost on the world that that was what was happening. As a matter of fact, that very one day, eight people came to faith in Christ. They came to faith in Christ in their front yards. Absolutely, praise God. They came to faith in Christ in their front yards. They came to faith in Christ around their kitchen tables. They came to faith in Christ in front of the shops that they were working in. They came to faith in Christ because people put off the pretentiousness and they put on their shoes to get busy with the mission that God had called them to. That is so important. You know, while I was down there, there's a really cool story. I was sitting, um, we went and visited the World War II Museum. If you ever have the chance to do that, I absolutely recommend it. But in the middle, Kai and I needed lunch. And if you know anything about my son, pizza was on his mind, okay? It's always on his mind. It wasn't a surprise. There happened to be a pizza shop, Magazine Pizza, that was right around the corner. And we go and we sit down to eat a couple slices of pizza. Now, this was a really cool blessing because, you know, Kai likes pepperoni pizza, I want all the veggies and everything else on my pizza. Maybe you're one way or the other, but on this particular day, happened to be Wednesday, it was buy one, get one free pizza. How cool is that, right? You can't pass up a deal like that. Buy one, get one free pizza. And so we're eating our pizza, but we're not going to finish our pizza. And I look across the table at Kai and I say, Kai, we need to find somebody to give our pizza away to. 
Now, here's the other thing you need to know about Kai. Like I said, Kai takes his pizza very seriously. You're going to do what, Dad? You're going to give away my pizza? And so I begin to have the conversation with Kai. I said, Kai, you know, we're not going to eat all this pizza. He says, no, we're not going to eat all this pizza now, right? I said, listen, we're not going to eat all this pizza. We don't have a car to put it in. If we did, New Orleans is not a cool city. If you know anything about it, it is a, a, a very uh, wonderful city, but it is not temperature-wise very cool. And so we didn't have a car. There was no place to put it. We still had a little bit more of the World War II Museum to go. I said, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give away this pizza to somebody on the street. He says, Dad, how do you know that we're going to find somebody on the street to give away this pizza to? Now, I had been walking up the street, and I had known that there was an overpass. And much like in many of our major cities, around overpasses are often people who are homeless, who are hungry, who are in poverty, who are in despair. I said, Kai, don't you worry about that. We're going to find somebody. And the guy at the very next table looks at me. He goes, you're doing a good thing. And I don't know if he was a believer or not, but he says, you're doing a good thing. Do you see the overpass over there? I said, I've already seen the overpass. We're going to go find somebody. So we take this pizza, we don't walk very far, we take about three steps out the door and Kai looks across the street at the overpass and he says, there's somebody. I said, that's right, there is somebody. You understand that? There is somebody. We walk across the street and immediately the guy sees that we have pizza in our hand and we begin a conversation with a young man named Michael. I want you to hear that it was certainly our intention to share the gospel with Michael. If Michael had not heard the gospel, we praised God with Michael because he was a believer in Jesus. But we would not have known that he was just a man on the street unless we walked across the street with the pizza in our hands. Here's the deal. If you are going to share the gospel, it is going to take you giving away your pizza. If you are going to share the gospel, it's going to take you using some of your time. If you are going to share the gospel, it's going to take you walking across streets that you otherwise wouldn't cross. If you are going to share the gospel, it's going to take you starting to see somebody and everybody. We need to be intentional about sharing the gospel. So number one, commit to being intentional. Number two, we need to go and tell. It's that simple. We need to go and tell. Every single one of us as followers of Christ, as church members here, ought to be inviting unchurched people to come and join us in our life and in our worship. I want to give you three numbers. I hope you write them down this morning. It's the number 10, the number 20, and the number two. The number 10, the number 20, and the number two. The first one is this. You've heard me say it before, and Mark can confirm it. Our, uh, our director of missional leadership here in our association, so grateful uh, that he's one of our members and pushes us in the areas of mission. If 10% of Claremont County were to get up this morning and decide to come to church, 10%, Claremont County gets up this morning, decides to come to church, there are not enough seats in our churches, not just Southern Baptist churches, but in our East evangelical churches and our Catholic churches and in some of the people that we wouldn't even consider churches, there's not enough seats to fill them. Let me just ask you to do me a favor this morning. I just want you to look by your side. Just look around. Are there empty seats in this place this morning? 10% of people have attended church. Well, not even 10% of people have attended church today. You need to know the number 10. We need to be reaching. This is a big number. Right? How about this number? 20%. 20% of believers, only 20% of believers will invite somebody to come and join them for worship this year. Did you hear that? Only 20% of believers will invite somebody to come and join them in worship this year. My question to you is why so few? Do we believe that this is a place where we experience God's goodness and his presence along with his people? 
Do we believe that this is a place where God's word is preached? Does it go forth in power? Is it impacting lives? If so, why are only 20% of people inviting people to come to church? And it gets worse. Two, only 2% of those people are actually inviting unchurched and lost people to join them for worship. Only 2%. That means the other 18% that makes up the 20% are just inviting friends and family that are in town for the year. That means the other 18% are just inviting people. Oh, you're unhappy with your church. Why don't you come over to our church? Listen, we don't need to be about sheep stealing in this place. There are way too many lost sheep that are looking for a home. Amen? Amen. We have a job to do. Invite one unchurched, unsaved person to come and join you for worship that they might hear the goodness and the word of God, which doesn't return void. It's not the pastor in the pulpit, but the word of God. Listen to me. Invite one person to come along with you. This is absolutely huge. For some of us, it needs to start like this. Maybe they're not going to darken the doors of the church, but they're willing to come over for dinner. They're willing to come and have a meal with you. They're willing to come and fellowship with you, break bread with you. And sometime over that dinner, sometime this year, here's what I want you to do. One person, one dinner at some point in this one year, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look up that person across the table and here's all I want you to do. Can I share my story with you? Because if Jesus has changed your life, then you have a story. That story might be when you were five or six years old. That story might be when you were a lost, moronic teenager like me. That story might be when you were in college. That story might be when you had a job. That story might be when you randomly showed up for church for you don't know what reason, but God spoke to you. You have a story if you are a believer in Christ. And so you're going to look at that person and you're simply going to stay one person, one meal, one time this year. Look at that person and say, can I share my story with you? And then you're going to take the next three to five minutes and you're going to tell them what Jesus has done for you. You might want to take a moment, memorize a couple of scriptures, if you will, beforehand. Share with them the Romans road or share with them something else. I, I, I'm saying prepare for it, pray for it, but by golly, do it. We need to be inviting that one person into our lives. We need to be sharing that story which God has given us. Oh my goodness. We need to be sharing Christ. I believe God has called us to do nothing less. There's a story that was written in a book called People Sharing Jesus by a guy named Daryl Robinson. And it's the first time that I've heard it this past week, and it really shook me up. I want to share it with you. The story goes like this. Now it came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. And lo, there were many fish in the waters all around. And in fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams and lakes, and the streams and lakes were filled with fish. And the fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, and year after year, those who called themselves fishermen met in meetings and talked about their call to fish, the abundance of fish, and how they might go about the task of fishing. Year after year, they carefully defined what fishing means. They defended fishing as an occupation, and they declared that fishing is always to be the primary task of every fisherman. Continually, they searched for new and better methods of fishing, for new and better definitions of fishing. They created witty slogans and displayed them on big, beautiful banners. These fishermen then built large, beautiful buildings, and they called them fishing headquarters. And the plea was that everyone should be a fisherman and that every fisherman should fish. But the one thing they didn't do, they did not fish. In addition to meeting regularly, they organized the board to send out fishermen to other places where there were many fish. They hired staff and appointed committees and held many meetings to define fishing, defend fishing, and decide what new streams should be thought about. But the staff and the committee members didn't fish. 
large, elaborate, expensive training centers like seminaries, right, were built whose original primary purpose was to teach fishermen how to fish. Over the years, courses were offered in the needs of fish, the nature of fish, and how to find fish, the reactions of fish, and how to approach and feed the fish. Those who taught had doctorates in fishology, but the teachers did not fish. They only taught about fishing. You see, year after year, after tedious training, many were graduated and were given the fishing license that they were long hoping for. They were sent to do full-time fishing, some in distance waters, which were filled with many fish. Many who felt the call to be fishermen responded. They were commissioned and prayed over and sent to fish, but like the fishermen back home, they too never fished. They engaged in all kinds of occupations. Some felt their job was to relate to the fish in a good way. So the fish would know the difference between a good and a bad fisherman. Others felt that simply letting the fish know that they were nice land-loving neighbors and how loving and kind they were was surely enough. Now it's true that many fishermen sacrificed much. They put up with all kinds of difficulties and some lived near the water and bore the smell of dead fish every single day. They received the ridicule of some who made fun of their fishermen's clubs and the fact that they claimed to be fishermen yet they never fished. Imagine how hurt some were when one day a person suggested that those who don't fish were not really fishermen at all. No matter how much they claimed to be, yet it did sound correct. Is a person a fisherman if year after year he never fishes? Or more plainly stated, is one really following If he isn't fishing, can we claim to be followers of Jesus if we are not fishing for men? At the very beginning of his gospels, Jesus says, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. Follow me and I am going to make you fishers of men. Follow me and not that you will somehow learn to be a fisher of men. Not that if you're good enough, you will become a fisher of men. Not that if you are smart enough, you will learn enough to be a fisher of men, but follow me and Jesus promises that he will make you a fisher of men. In other words, if you're not fishing, you aren't following. Do we understand the implication of what scripture is calling us to do as the church? Where does that leave us? If we're not fishing, we're not following. Where does that leave us? Here's number three. Number three is this. We need to recognize and repent of our excuses. We need to recognize and repent of our excuses. This hit me this week, and I, I, I hope it's not true. See, if I were up here preaching today about the sin of promiscuity and those who are leading promiscuous lives needing to repent, the church, by large part, it would, it would give us a hearty amen. If I were up here today preaching, and by the way, it, it, it's awful, and we just came out of our Sanctity of Human Life Week. If I were up here preaching and railing against the sin of abortion, then that abortion is murder, the church would give me a hearty amen. But what about the sin of not fishing? What about the sin of ignoring the one thing that God has called every single disciple to do? What about that sin? Are we ready to amen that? Because that sin is my sin. Because that sin's your sin. It's a lot easier to amen when the sin's somebody else's sin. But this is our sin that we need to own, that we need to repent of, that we need to do something about. This idea of biblical repentance isn't simply saying, I'm sorry, church family. That's not what biblical repentance is. Repentance is the idea that we turn around and we go in the other direction. In other words, we stop doing it the way that we have been doing it, not fishing, and we start doing it the way that Jesus has called us to do it. We take out our fishing poles and we start fishing. Do we understand the real implication of what God's word is saying to us this morning? We need to repent of our excuses 
Here's 10 that you're going to hear in D groups. If you're in D groups later this week, I'll cover them quickly because we don't have much time. We need to repent of spiritual lethargy. This takes place when we fail to obey. This is about the Christians who have long sat in church, but they've not ever gone out and done anything about it. At one point, perhaps in your walk with Jesus, you had a hot heart for sharing Jesus. At one point in your walk with Jesus, would you share with everybody who would give you ear? But over the years, you have become lethargic. You have become cold. It is time to repent of our coldness and time to get back to fishing. We need to repent of growing inclusiveness. In other words, my friends are here. The people I like are here. And if we get serious about fishing and we get serious about inviting and we get serious about sharing, there might come a time when there's people that I don't like that are showing up here. You know what? The church might grow too big and I might not know everybody. How horrible would that be that God's kingdom would grow? Boo hoo. Listen, we need to repent of growing, growing inclusiveness. We need to repent of our disbelief in hell. We need to repent of the fact that we don't really, really honestly believe that hell is real and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and that nobody goes to the Father but through him. Because if we really believe that hell is real, we would be on a mission like firefighters to put it out. We need to repent of busyness. I'm too busy to go fishing. Listen, if we're too busy to go fishing, something else needs to go. We need to repent of our fear of rejection. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. Our job's to share Jesus. His job's to save the soul. We need to repent of our fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, right, or timidity, but of power and love and self-control. That's what, he, that's what Paul writes to Timothy. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and self-control. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you if you are a follower of Jesus. That love that drew you ought to be shown through you if you're following Jesus. We need to realize that he has not given us a spirit of fear. How about this one? A desire to be tolerant anymore in our society. We live in a society that says, well, you know, if you believe Jesus is the only way, then you're not being tolerant. Listen, if we believe Jesus is the only way, it is the only loving and kind thing that we can do to share him. We need to repent that we have lost the habit of witnessing. For many reasons, we have quit witnessing. We have quit making disciples. We can regain it, but it begins with repentance. We need to repent of our lack of accountability that nobody's asking us on a weekly basis. Have you shared the gospel? How are you praying for somebody that needs to know Christ? That is why we have our D groups here at Clough. There is a place for you to have accountability. We need to repent of our failure to invite. 10, 20, 2, let us be a church that invites the lost to come and experience the wondrous presence of our glorious Savior. We need to repent of our failure to invite the lost. And my goodness. We need to repent as a church, as a whole, that we are not nearly intentional enough about reaching the lost. There are so many things that occupy our time, but God has called this one thing to be what we're about. I used to say something along these lines. My degrees are in evangelism and missions, in case you didn't know. I have a bachelor's a master's of divinity, a theological master's, and a PhD, all in the area of evangelism and missions. A church family, if we are not sharing the gospel, all the accolades and the awards, they don't mean a hill of beans until we get this one thing serious and until we take this one thing serious. Could God change the trajectory of your life, of your church. He can, but it's going to be recognizing our need to repent and get right in this one area to be about this one mission. And it begins with that one person that you put on a card at the beginning of service. We're going to pray.
as we have our time of invitation. God, we come to you this morning. Oh, what a challenging message. I, I admit it challenged me. It stepped on my toes. God, you have called us to do this one thing, and so many of us have spent a lot of time distracted with anything but this. God, may our hearts, may the fire of your spirit burn bright. Heat our hearts so that they would be hot for you and hot to get you to a lost and dying world. Burden us in this way. God, let us be sorrowful people that we have not been the fishermen that you have called us to be. Help us to get right with you in this area. Burden us when we leave this place. Transform our lives. Make us like Jesus. Because his mission was to seek and save the lost. And he's called us to walk alongside him and do likewise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe like me, some of you feel your heart has not been hot for Jesus. It hasn't been hot to share the gospel. And you just need to come and repent. There's nothing bad about that. Oh my gosh, somebody's going to see me. Who cares? I invite you to come and pray at the altar this morning. That Jesus would change our hearts, transform our lives, and empower us to carry out his work. Today, tomorrow, as long as we have breath, That's the invitation. Stand and sing with us. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed.
Listen, as our ushers are coming forward, I, I never like to leave a message without giving a gospel invitation. So here's the invitation. If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, this Jesus whom we are talking about, this Jesus that still transforms lives today, and you'd like to learn more about him, I'd love to talk to you after church. There's nothing more important than knowing that when you leave here today, that you have trusted Jesus. Where will you spend eternity? We want you to have the answers there. So if you'd like to talk to somebody, grab me, grab Stephen, you can grab Mark or or a lot of our leaders, but we would love to talk to you about that. Listen, Tom, will you pray over our offering? And especially because when we give, missionaries do receive money. We give to support missions that people are fishing, and we're going to fish alongside them. Will you pray that God will bless this fund, these funds? that he will further his kingdom. I'd love for you to pray like that this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are blessed in so many ways. We're blessed to be in your house this morning to hear your word. We ask, we pray, Lord, that you will give us a giving spirit this morning as we take this offering. And we pray that you, you will use it to further your kingdom, to reach those countries that we send our missionaries to, Lord. Uh, pray that we are fishermen. Lord, be with us through the rest of this week and help us to pray for our ones. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thing, just a reminder to our to our students, to our youth, that we're we're having a we're having a, a Super Bowl party at our house. That's right, Super Bowl party at our house, five thirty. It'll be a lot of fun, and then you got to go home at halftime because it's a school night. So let's all let's all close in worship as we sing. Your love never fails.